Hi, I really encourage you to get involved with Jason and his team. The whole group over there is just fantastic. I started working with them probably 10 years ago. So the main thing is get in the game, get started, get that first property or get six. Uh, many people buy dozens, but I think the world of this group, they've helped me a lot. And uh, I think that you'll really enjoy the process. Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Welcome to Creating Wealth with Jason Hartman. During this program, Jason is going to tell you some really exciting things that you probably haven't thought of before and a new slant on investing. Fresh new approaches to America's best investment that will enable you to create more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made, multi-millionaire who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. He's been a successful investor for 20 years and currently owns properties in 11 states and 17 cities. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to financial freedom. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is episode number 293. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we've got another great show for you today. It is New Year's Eve, and I just wanted to wish everybody a very happy New Year with all the stuff going on with a fiscal cliff that has not been resolved. But hey, Congress got a pay raise. That's what's important. We got to make sure we take care of take care of all the crooks running the government, right? <laughs> it's unbelievable. You, you couldn't make this stuff up. It's so ridiculous. So Sometimes. But with the guests today and with just all the stuff in the news, I want you to go into the new year, into 2013, with just the utmost confidence that regardless of how ridiculous our our country is being run and how ridiculous that frankly the whole world is being run it's not just the u.s it's the rest of the world too it's just beyond ridiculous with all that is going on just know that by the very best strategy you know nothing is perfect nobody can say for sure nobody knows what will happen for sure but if you've been a listener for the last nearly 300 episodes i am sure you will agree with me that we have the right strategy for the current environment of ridiculousness, we'll call it that. <laughs> and just know and have confidence that you've positioned yourself for what is going on, for what is probably to come, and you're on the right side of it. You've got time on your side, you've got irresponsible government on your side, you've got the ridiculous conspiracy known as the Federal Reserve. It's I guess it's not really a conspiracy, but maybe it is. I don't know. You've got that on your side. You've got all of these things that are working for you rather than against you. Because frankly, you've adopted the same strategy they're using. The strategy based on inflating your way out of the problem. And if it doesn't happen, you're still on the right side of things. For many reasons, which we've talked about in the past, and we will continue to talk about over the coming year. Just want to wish everybody a very, very happy new year. Be sure to check out all of the stuff at jasonhartman.com that we have for you. The blog, the products... The upcoming events, our next tour, our next Creating Wealth Boot Camp and Property Tour that we will probably have in Houston, and then all of the stuff that we've got coming up throughout the coming year. And for those of you coming to the Meet the Masters event in January, which is totally sold out, we look forward to seeing all of you in just a couple of weeks at that event, January 18th, and I will be bringing my new puppy to that event. So you'll get to meet her at that event, my first puppy. And my first female dog, I, I've always adopted mature dogs before, and I adopted this one recently from the animal shelter. It's rare that you get a puppy from the animal shelter, but, you know, I wasn't really ready after my other dog passed away uh, that I had for almost 14 years and, and loved very much. But I, I went to the animal shelter to go start looking because it took me months and months and months. I can't even remember how long to find him almost uh, 14 years ago. I went and I just kind of got lucky. I saw these, there was this litter of five puppies 
that someone dropped off and surrendered. And they said, there's a raffle for them. Put your name in. So I put my name in and heck, I got first pick. Imagine that, the pick of the litter, if you will. So I'll bring the new puppy to the Meet the Masters event in January. I always brought the old one. And so you'll get a chance to meet her. Her name is Coco. And I just want to wish you all a very happy new year. And we will look forward to seeing a lot of you at the Meet the Masters event, Hyatt Regency Irvine. By the way, I know that all of you have not reserved your rooms. So be sure to do that. Go to uh, jasonhartman.com. All the information is there on the site and get get your room reserved to, to make sure you're all covered for that. And you do not need a rental car if you're flying into John Wayne Airport. The hotel is right near the airport and there's a free shuttle or you can take a taxi. So don't bother renting a car. It's just easier without a car, frankly, and just super convenient to uh, John Wayne or Orange County Airport. Airport code is SNA, as most of you know. Anyway, let's go to our guest. And again, Happy New Year. Look forward to some great stuff in 2013. And we thank you so much for your continued support. And we will be right back with our guest in just a moment. My pleasure to welcome Richard Duncan to the show. He is an expert on dollar collapse. He is an author, an economist, a consultant, and a speaker. And he's the author of three books on the dollar crisis and the economic crisis. And today we'll talk about specifically his latest work. He just got back from touring the U.S. for the last four weeks. And he is coming to us from Bangkok today. Richard, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Uh, Thanks for having me on your show. Well, the pleasure is all mine. So tell us about your latest work, and especially about the quantity theory of credit and how it played a huge role in the crisis. Okay, well, the the new book is called The New Depression, The Breakdown of the Paper Money Economy. And the theme of this book is that when we broke the link between dollars and gold in 1968, this removed all the constraints on how much credit could be created. And afterwards, credit in the United States absolutely exploded. Total credit, and by that I mean government debt, household sector debt, corporate debt, and financial sector debt, in other words, all the debt, it first went through $1 trillion in 1964. And then over the following 43 years, it expanded 50 times to $50 trillion by 2007. And this explosion of credit is the thing that really created our world. It made us much more prosperous than we would have been otherwise. Uh, It ushered in the age of globalization by allowing the U.S. to finance its massive trade deficits with credit denominated in paper money. The problem is, of course, in 2008, the private sector in the U.S. couldn't repay its debt. And at that point, the global economic crisis started. And ever since, we had been teetering on the verge of collapsing into a new Great Depression. The only thing that has kept that from occurring is the massive annual trillion-dollar budget deficits by the U.S. government. You know, that's an interesting statement you made in the in the beginning of that response, where you said this explosion of credit, which is a massive explosion of credit, is what allowed us to become so prosperous. Now, the real question is, is that prosperity, was that an illusion created by credit, or legitimately leverage and financing does allow for growth, which can become legitimate growth ultimately, if used prudently. I just wanted to kind of get your take on that, because I think to to a, a decent extent, if not a large extent, the prosperity is a bit of an illusion. Well, I agree. To, to a considerable extent, it has been something of an illusion, but a very good one. When when credit expands, it's rapidly, it, it drives the economic growth. And it's easy to understand how credit growth drives economic growth. As long as credit's expanding rapidly, then the consumers have more money to spend. So they spend more, and therefore businesses are, are more profitable, and they hire more people, and they expand their capacity. They even pay more taxes, so the government has more money to spend. And all the while, asset prices keep going higher and higher. The thing is, is though, the day always comes when the credit can't expand any further. And that, that day arrives because eventually the amount of credit in the system is so great that the income of the public simply is no longer sufficient to service the interest on all the debt. And then the, the, they begin to default. And this whole world that was built on ever-expanding credit then begins to implode. And that, that's what we experienced 
starting in 2008. So this expansion of credit has been going on for so long now, four and a half decades, it's really completely restructured the, the entire global economy. It played a big role in the U.S. being deindustrialized and moving from a manufacturing-based system to a service-based system based on finance and real estate. So they completely changed the structure of the U.S. and the global economy over a multi-decade long period. And so this was a long-lasting illusion. And now the danger is, is that if credit begins to contract, contract significantly, then we are going to experience an equally long and severe multi-decade economic crash or depression. It's interesting that we're talking so much about credit because it has largely been ignored, frankly, in my opinion. You know, when you when you hear the inflationist and the gold bugs talking, they're always talking about how Nixon closed the gold window in 71, and that's what changed everything, and the government could print money ad infinitum, and there was no restraint anymore. But they really don't talk about the creation of credit. They talk about the creation of, of the money supply. And in in this in the great recession that we're still in it's it's funny that we haven't had more inflation frankly in my opinion but but i think the reason for that is is largely because it's not just about money supply now the money supply has increased dramatically but the supply of credit has actually contracted and i think it's a balance between the two and you know money is credit of course you could say that and maybe i'm not kind of drilling down enough or making enough distinction between the two, they're not exactly the same. I'd I just like to get your take on that. Right. Well, I think this is a very fascinating subject, and this is something that I write, write a lot about in the book. People, as you say, focus a lot on 1971 and Nixon closing the gold window. But I think an even more significant step occurred a few years before that in 1968. In 1968, President Johnson asked Congress to change the law. Up until that time, it, it had been a law that the Federal Reserve had to maintain at least 25% gold backing for every dollar that it issued. And Johnson, there had been no problem with the Fed doing that after World War II because the U.S. had most of the world's gold. But they actually came up against that binding constraint in 1968, and at President Johnson's request, they removed that requirement. And Afterwards, the Fed could issue paper money with, without having any gold backing whatsoever. And at that point, that is when the nature of money changed. Before then, there was a very clear distinction between money and credit. In those days, money was gold and credit was credit. Then, if you took a dollar bill to the Treasury Department, at least in theory, they had to give you some gold for it. Now they'll just give you another paper dollar. So there's no longer any real difference now between money and credit. A dollar bill, for example, what's the difference now between a dollar bill and a 10-year treasury bond? They're both essentially credit instruments. The dollar pays no interest, and the treasury bond pays next to no interest. So the distinction between money and credit has become blurred or perhaps disappeared altogether. And that's why in this book I introduce something I call the quantity theory of credit, which is an adaptation of the quantity theory of money. They say the quantity theory of money is the oldest surviving economic theory dating back to the 1500s. And that's the thing that all of monetary policy and monetarism is based on. And the idea was, and still is, that if you increase the amount of money in a country, for whatever reason, you discover a new gold mine or you print a lot of paper money, well, what happens is you get a short-term economic boom, but the boom doesn't last very long because pretty soon you have inflation, and the inflation kills the boom. So you have a short-term boom and a short-term bust, and generally not too much damage is done. But the thing that has changed now, well, before, you could only expand the money supply for a short while in most cases because gold was money and there was a limited amount of it. So you tended to have short-term booms and short-term busts. But what has changed is, as I said, the nature of money is completely different now. Money and credit are the same thing. 
So there's no longer any point in monitoring the traditional monetary aggregates like M1, M2, M3. The thing that we have to monitor now is C, in other words, total credit. This number that I've mentioned that has increased from $1 trillion to $50 trillion in just four and a half decades. There has been a, and the thing that, so this is what I call the quantity theory of credit instead of the quantity theory of money. And the, the important difference between the two is that whereas you could only expand the money supply for a short time, creating a short-term boom followed by a short-term bust, now in our world that we've lived through for the last five decades, we've been able to expand the quantity of credit 50 times in 45 years. And that explosion of credit has created an unprecedented global economic boom. But the danger is now, if this credit begins to contract in any significant way, that we are going to spiral into what the economist Irving Fisher described as a debt deflation depression. Hasn't it already contracted massively, though? I mean, and when it contracted, as the deleveraging was occurring, it was really actually sucking up more dollars because the dollar still happens to be the reserve currency for whatever amount of time that lasts. And it actually strengthened the dollar. It was kind of counterintuitive. Well, the number that I use is reported by the Federal Reserve, the, the, this total credit number that I'm talking about. They report it in their flow of funds data that they publish every three months. And this, the total credit number, it hasn't significantly contracted. In fact, it, it, it flattened out, which was already quite unusual, and now it's expanding a little bit again. And the reason it didn't contract is private sector debt started contracting because a lot of defaults took place. But that contraction in private sector debt was offset or even more than offset by the expansion of government debt. The U.S. government debt, has, because of the budget deficits, it's expanded by $5 trillion over the last four years. And it's been that expansion of government debt that has prevented total credit from contracting and therefore prevented us from spiraling into a debt deflation and death spiral. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Jason provides an extremely unique service, Deal Evaluator. Are you interested in a property outside of our network? Need a second opinion? No problem. Let our experts evaluate the deal. Find out more about it at jasonhartman.com. The price is only $50. I, I guess the classical inflation happens when a larger supply of currency or chasing a limited supply of goods and services. And it, it sort of makes you wonder, like you, you made an interesting statement a few moments ago. You said money creation can only happen for a limited time. Did I hear that correctly? And if if so, why would that be? Why Why can't money creation just go on forever? Of course, it leads to inflationary collapse eventually, and it leads to Zimbabwe and Hungary and Argentina and Weimar. But what really limits it other than that ultimate demise? Or is that what you're referring to? Well, what I meant to say earlier is that before, when gold was money, when we were on a gold-backed monetary system, you could only expand the money supply for a short while because there was only so much money. There was only so much gold. Yeah, in, it in was limited. System. It was that's that's why they call it sound money, right? <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. exactly right. And the government had nothing to do with it. Yeah. And but of course, it's an entirely different world now that we've moved on to a fiat money system. Yeah. So so why though would there be a limit on the amount of money creation. It seems to me like when it's complete fiat, it can just go on forever. Yes, it's destructive, but can it just go on forever? I mean, like I've heard the deflationists say, and it sounds like you might be one of them, I'm not sure yet, but I've heard them say, make statements like this, they can't print enough money to stop the deleveraging and the deflationary forces out there they're bigger than the amount of money they can print. And that never made sense to me, Richard, because what's to, there's no limit on the amount of money that can be created. Well, you're right. Now there is no limit on how much paper money that the government can create. Or, or electronic that, money. It's even easier than paper. It's not even paper. It's just electronic. <laughs> That's right. I, I, I mean electronic when I say paper. I know. It's a metaphor. Uh, they don't I get it. print any paper any, anymore, I guess which is cheaper. They don't even have to buy the paper or the ink. <laughs> I know. It's ridiculous. 
But so yes, I mean, they can continue to do this, but there are a number of varying forces at play here. We would have already had hyperinflation a long time ago, except for one other completely separate development that's occurred more or less simultaneously with this explosion of credit. And that development has been globalization. Because of globalization, this has resulted in extreme deflationary pressures in the world. And that's because as a result of globalization, it's no longer necessary to hire someone in Michigan to build a car and pay that person $200 a day. Now you can hire someone in India and pay that person $5 a day to build a car. So this represents a 95% drop in the marginal cost of labor. Your next worker, the cost of hiring your next worker just fell 95% because of globalization. And nothing like this has ever occurred before. This is, they say there are three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. The cost of one of them has collapsed by 95%. So this is extraordinarily deflationary. I agree. And this, this is putting downward pressure on the price of all the manufactured goods. And that is that's the reason we've avoided so much inflation so far. Right, right. And I, I agree. I, I mean, we've exported. We've imported deflation or exported inflation, I guess you could put it either way, to other countries through goods. And the world, for the first time in human history, is awash in goods. I mean, goods are plentiful. Prices are cheap. It's amazing. But here's the thing. Once we have already, and I'll use a word that has a negative connotation, but exploited all this cheap labor, which it seems like the the global supply chain has done a pretty good job of that already, with China being the workshop of the world, India and the Philippines being the call centers of the world, and the code writers and software producers of the world. So we've already done that. I mean, where do we go next? That That has already hit the hedonic index. The the exploitation of cheap labor has occurred. It's it's dropped by ninety five percent, and now we actually see labor costs going up, although slightly because it's so much cheaper than America still. But we see wages rising in China. So so aren't we? It, it hasn't that all already occurred? That that's already priced into the global economy. Well, I, of course, it has occurred to a considerable extent, and yes, over the last several years. Wages in China have gone up, but you have to keep in mind that China now is at the very peak of a very long economic bubble, and there's a very real possibility that China's bubble is going to pop. In fact, I would say it's almost certain, and when it it does, wages are not going to continue to go higher. In fact, they're very likely to drop in China. Only a few years ago, when the U.S. crisis started, China's trade surplus with the U.S. contracted for that one year. And the headlines in China were 20 million factory workers lose their jobs and have to go back to the countryside. I I remember those videos were rather striking when we saw the video of the workers literally leaving the factories. That was pretty shocking to see that. Exactly. And, And now it's very likely that wages in China are going to stop going up now that their bubble is is beginning to deflate. Now, they they could have a very hard landing, or they may have a more soft landing like Japan has had for the last 20 years. But either way, their wages aren't going to continue appreciating. And, I mean, let's let's not become too optimistic about the level of Chinese wages. 80% of the people in China still earn less than $10 a day. And so if the Chinese wages ever went to the astronomically high level of $15 a day, the jobs would just move to India where there are easily 500 million people who would happily work for $5 a day. So I think there's a whole lot further to go in this process of pushing down wages in the developed countries like the United States and Europe. There are still many more jobs that can be shipped to India and China and Vietnam and India, Indonesia, uh, given how dramatically lower wages still are there relative to the U.S. and Europe. So this is a whole lot further. This de- de- globalization, deflationary pressures can drive us down. Well, th- that's interesting, and, and fair enough on all of that. I would just say, as a one skepticism that arises, is that yes, maybe they can get five dollar an hour or five dollar a day labor versus 
$10 a day labor. However, what real difference does that make in the price of a product that is already 95% lower than labor cost in westernized, prosperous westernized countries, or I should say westernized countries living under the illusion of prosperity like America? <laughs> How do you like that one? <laughs> right. Well, you know, for instance, as technology continues to advance, in the future, the Americans may have the option of consulting a doctor in India uh, over the Internet or Skype and paying that doctor 90% less than they pay their American doctor, putting all the American doctors essentially out of business. Or, you know, I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration. No, I, I get the idea. One, one example of how globalization could, could continue to put down more pressure on the wage structure across the spectrum in the U.S. Yeah, very interesting, interesting stuff. So you see a deflationary future then, right? Well, I think the future, I think everyone needs to understand that after this four and a half decade long credit-induced global economic bubble, now the only thing that is preventing us from collapsing into a depression is the government. The governments are spending trillions of dollars in budget deficits, and finance, financing a lot of this with paper money creation. So going forward, whether or not we have inflation or deflation is going to depend on what the government policy is. And when you try to project out five or ten years into the future, you really can't say with any certainty what the government policy will be at that point, because we don't know who the government will be. Well, generally, though, I mean, two things just generally come up there. And I love the way Bill Bonner with Agora Financial, the Daily Reckoning, I'm sure you're familiar with Bill. The way he said it was interesting. I remember reading a long time ago in one of his newsletters, he said, politics always list, listing like a boat, list to the left. It generally, the, the, the nature of the political thing is it becomes more liberal, government becomes bigger. Certainly, we don't know what the government will be like 10 years from now, but if you just look at human nature alone, politicians throughout history have always pandered for votes. And the way they do that is by offering free stuff to people. You know, who was it? George Bernard Shaw, a government that robs Peter to pay Paul can always count on the support of Paul. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and, and so that generally to me says money creation and a tendency to have QE 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, QE 92, call it by whatever name you want, but more money creation. Deflation is too hard a pill to swallow because it, it it's really destructive, maybe more so than inflation, in my opinion, because deflation causes people to wait, and waiting reduces the velocity of money. And when you reduce the velocity of money, that's a more, feeds more into that spiral. So it, it seems to me that the preference is to inflate your way out of the debt inflate your way out of the promises you've made, that seems to be the best business plan for politicians that want to win elections, you know, and keep their jobs. You raised a lot of interesting points there, going back to the beginning of what you were saying just now about uh, politics tending generally to move toward the left. And everyone should not forget that we have only had democracy in the West, universal universal voting for less than 100 years. Uh, it wasn't that long ago where, or in just a few centuries ago, where we you know, had landed the landed aristocracy, the kings had complete control of everything. And so if you look back to what happened, it hasn't always moved continually to the left, even within the last 100 years. For instance, the last time we had a credit bubble like this was during the 1920s. And that credit bubble came about for a similar reason. We broke the link between dollars, or between, well, between money and gold during World War I to fight the war. All the European nations went off the gold standard, and they created a lot of paper money to fight the war in Europe, and they issued a lot of government debt. And all the debt and paper money issued to fight World War I led to a credit bubble that we call the Roaring Twenties, and when, similar to the one that we have now. And when that bubble popped, politics didn't necessarily move to the left. In Europe, politics took a hard turn to the right. The Germans became fascist and took over, and, and took over Europe. 
and the Japanese became fascist and took over Asia, and the democracy was almost completely wiped out. In the U.S., it took a, a shift to the left under FDR, and FDR, in a sense, saved capitalism from itself. So it's not certain that things will necessarily keep moving, uh, as you say, toward the left or toward greater democracy or social equality. I don't mean greater democracy. I just mean greater pandering. If you look at communist revolution in, in Russia, for example, that was a movement toward more free stuff, essentially. If you look at the Nazi party, that was the, that was the National Socialist so it, it, it's sort of, I don't know, I guess one could debate whether those were right or left movements, actually, depending on how you look at it. I don't know. Maybe you disagree with me. You're welcome to. <laughs> I, I just, just a thought. Well, I mean, again, interesting, interesting issues there. But I think, in the United, for, I think in the United States, everybody should recognize that the sort of system that we actually have in reality is not what it's presented to be. I mean, we're told we have a capitalist system, but in fact, there's very little about the kind of system that we have in the United States now that is capitalist. For instance, the government spends 24% of GDP. That means one out of every $4 is spent by the government. That's insane. And, of course, as you have already mentioned, in addition to that, so that, that's not capitalism, but, but also under, cap, under capitalism, gold was money, and the government had nothing to do with it. Now the Fed creates the money and manipulates its value. And, and the growth dynamic is completely different. Under capitalism, economic growth occurred through investment and savings. In other words, businessmen would invest. Some of them would make a profit. They would save that profit or, or accumulate the capital, hence capitalism, and repeat investment and savings, investment and savings. That's how capitalism created growth. But in our system, our system has been driven by a completely different process for the last four decades. Our system has been driven by credit creation and consumption, and more credit creation and more consumption. Uh, and that's created very rapid economic growth, but now the danger is it looks like this new system, which I call creditism instead of capitalism, it looks like creditism can't expand any further because the private sector can't repay the debt that it has already. And so I mean, when you really look at the reality of our economic system, there seems to be a tendency to think that most of the government money is spent on supporting poor people, but that's not really true. I mean, the government spends so much in so many ways, it really supports every seg segment of society, the very wealthy, the middle class, and the poor. Our, our entire social structure is built around government spending and government intervention. And so it's not as simple as a left-right argument in a 19th century sort of framework. Really, our entire structure of our society is built around the government spending 24% of GDP. Almost every major industry is, is supported by the government one way or the other, and 50% of the households are receiving some sort of government support. So we don't have, this isn't capitalism, we already have some sort of government-directed, credit-driven economic system. We're just not managing it very well. Mm, fair enough. You won't get any disagreement from me on any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Un unfortunately, <laughs> you are you are right on. You are right on with that. Well, hey, give out your website, and I, I'm sure people can get your books on Amazon.com and all the usual places, right? That's right. Yes, so my, my website is RichardDuncanEconomics.com, and the latest book is called The New Depression, The Breakdown of the Paper Money Economy. My, my business is I'm a consultant and speaker, so I frequently travel around the world making speeches and and meeting with in normally institutional investors. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us from across the world, and we appreciate your thoughts and your insights. Very interesting. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn more about investing in real estate in different markets, there's a show for that. If you want to learn 17 ways rich people think and act differently, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to get paid to borrow, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know why Amsterdam doesn't take dollars or why pools are for fools, there are even shows for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store.
This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.